and hopefully it'll work. Okay, oops, okay, there we go. Yeah. Great, so um looks like we've lost three people already, so it's a pretty high rate of attrition. We'll see how many find of the week. Uh, so you all had a chance um, to try out the glass just a little bit. What was your um, some of your impressions from, from wearing it? I guess for most of you it's the first time you've worn the display. Uh, yeah, they do. <laughs> That's true. If you run the camera and, and continuously and everything, it does get quite hot. But I haven't been burnt yet, so don't worry about getting burnt. Any other impressions apart from? <laughs> yeah, it's because it's a 15 degree field of view, so they, they so so it's a very narrow field of view. So they squeeze a lot of pixels into a very narrow field of view. But it is when people um, wear that, sometimes they're surprised by what the resolution is. They think it's much higher. Um, that looks feasible for text. Yes, yes. Um, um, we probably want to have like 16 point font or larger. Um, there is a web browser integrated into that as well, so you can browse um, uh, the web. If you Google for certain um, terms, sometimes they'll pull up web pages and you can click through the links and see the pages, and they reformat for the, for the thing as well. Any other thoughts, feedbacks? I found the um, voice was probably the easiest way to use it. Right. Uh, sort of a little bit awkward talking to yourself. <laughs> yeah, a bit socially awkward, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and we'll talk, we'll talk about that a little bit later, is that um, uh, there's some research being done now on other ways to interact with glass. It's, you know, it's like the first Bluetooth headset guys you'd see standing in the corner always talking to themselves. You don't really want to do that all the time. How about for you, Tracy? Do you have any thoughts at all? Oh, yeah, I thought the resolution was clear, but right, it's so it's spatially important. Yeah. 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 Talking to your headset. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and what did you think about the um, the user interface in general, in terms of um, you know the gestures and, and how easy it was to um, use? Is that natural? Or is it difficult? Or? I think it's a little bit difficult sometimes to remember where you were going with the first thing, you know, how far forward, back, or up, down. Right. You yeah. That yeah. Yeah. I noticed that there was like a, like a linear view mm -hmm. when you were swiping that way and looking up and down as well. So mm -hmm. it took a little minute to figure out those ways you were saying. Yes, true. So this one we're going to talk about now is we're going to talk about the user experience and I'm going to show you some other applications um, and then um, that'll lead into lunch. And what I'd like to do um, over lunch is um, for you guys to form um, groups. Um, as I said, we've got uh, four devices. So um, I was thinking it would be good for the Koreans to be one group because then they can all speak Korean together, which is good. And then um, the non-Koreans can self-organize themselves into um, three other groups. Um, and um, it would be good in, if in your group um, if you've got uh, one person who um, can uh, do some Android development, if possible, um, or at least not scared by Java and Android, um, and then um, as I said before, we'll have um, we'll also be doing processing as well. So if um, Android looks a bit foreign to you, then there's an opportunity to do use processing too. Um, so but now I'll talk about that as we get closer to lunch. So what I'm going to talk about now is a bit a little bit the user interface and user experience. So the current user interface looks like this. So as you would have discovered, it's basically a, a, a card metaphor with timelines, but it actually took a long time to get to that um, user interface. So just like how they rapidly prototyped um, the uh, device itself, they also rapidly prototyped different user interface ideas. So I'll just take you through a couple of those and I'll show you some of the early examples. And then I'll show you some examples of applications um, that you can, things you can do with Glass as well. So one of the first um, user interfaces was like this. So this is essentially just a um, Android um, uh, interface put onto the display. Um, so, um, why do you think this would be kind of a bad idea uh, with glass? 
Yeah, exactly. So, um, of course, it's really great with your Android phone because you can just push the buttons and select them. But when you've got um, a device like Glass, um, it turns out if, you tr if, you, if your trackpad is long and narrow, it's really hard to select things in 2D with long, narrow trackpads. So they pretty m quickly abandoned that idea as well. Um, they had some thought about putting a 2D trackpad, a small 2D trackpad, and going around like this on your own on the corner of your head. But it turns out that you don't get um, as much um, spatial um, input resolution as you do with a linear trackpad. The trackpad itself, oh, from memory, I should have had this written down, I think it's 1,650 pixels long and 167 pixels high. So it's a very long rectangular trackpad. Um, and you know, part of the design was uh, the idea to try and um, you know, minimize the size of the frame. Obviously, the first um, uh, prototypes they had was just Android phones stuck on the side of the head, so you had a very big trackpad area. But um, it, of course, you couldn't go out socially with a phone stuck to the side of your head. So this is about as small as they can get before you don't have any input area. So quickly, they moved away from um, 2D interfaces and then to other types of interfaces. So here's more linear um, interfaces they're exploring with. Um, if you notice, uh, this one here has a small cross here and uh, some small circles here. So there's work done on um, head uh, selection. So in fact, when I uh, first used um, uh, Glass, it was a very different interface. Um, what you did is you had to tilt your head back and look up. And then it would, and when you did that, it would turn on a strip of applications, and then you would swipe to pick the application you want, and then it would open the application up. Um, and then they tried also, um, as I said here, 2D uh, uh, head selection. So you you would have an array of icons. You'd turn your head up and around and target and pick the array. Um, it's it's fairly natural, but it turns out it's quite slow. So um, and also you look really silly if you're doing this all the time as well. So. And then they evolved that to um, a um, more linear um, interface. So here's some ideas for um, having um, apps kind of uh, collected um, uh, together. Um, and the first public interface was um, this interface here that was kind of designed around the metaphor of bubbles. And um, so let me show you a video of this working. And some of you may have seen this video. It was when Glass was first publicly announced, um, and it was shown. Um, uh, let's see. Find it. Oh, here we go. Project Glass one day. Yeah. So here's the bubbles interface. So when you look at a bubble long enough, it kind of expands and gets more information. Yeah. Um, maybe in front of Strand Books. Head two. So there's an alert happening. And this is the subways. And now it's going to show a map that you can walk to. Say something cool? Yeah, sure. Is that even delay 
So um, that was the first um, uh, kind of publicly announced uh, prototype interface. Um, what do you guys think of that in terms of what you've seen um, now? Just going to read Google now to it. Fantastic, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the Google now, no, that was another group that did it. But, but, it um, but Glass does run Google now on it, so just like other Android devices, yep. Any other thoughts about that? It's not talking yet, so just probably. Right. So it's kind of a voice-centric interface. Um, you know, he, he was giving commands, take a photo, things like that. Um, yeah. Um, you could see that it was still um, uh, these bubbles still required some head selection, and um, uh, so there's still work to be done. Uh, and then you know they realised that of course. Um, it wasn't going to be like that because um, when you're wearing glasses in, in the top right-hand corner, so instead of showing concept videos with the, the content in front of your face all the time, now they started exploring the top right-hand corner, and they realized, well, the things up in the top right-hand corner, the, the one way to neatly organize that is through have, having some sort of timeline of events. So here's some early timeline cards that were uh, put together, and that evolved into the cards that um, uh, we have uh, today. So the, the user interface design has moved away from this look of bubbles to cards, and then the basic uh, design metaphor is very clean uh, design, so very minimalist, um, you know, big pictures, um, high contrast text um, with only a few lines of text, things like that. And as I said before, you have this um, timeline metaphor. So the basic idea is that uh, the home screen is, um, or oh, the clock, is what's happening now. Everything on the right-hand side of the clock is what's happened in the past, and everything on the um, left-hand side of the clock is what's happening in the future. So um, some of you may have tried taking pictures, and when you're taking the pictures, those pictures um, go onto the immediate uh, right-hand side of the clock, organized by time. Um, sometimes you may have events that are happening uh, live. So for example, with um, Glass, you can do a Google Hangout, and you can do a live a conference with somebody, and that'll happen on the um, left-hand side. Or if you've got uh, events happening in the future, like um, uh, reminders or a sports games going on, or the weather, that's all on the right-hand side as well. And everything else is organized um, based upon the time uh, back it took. Um, we'll talk about this a bit more in the future, but, but Glass is supposed to be very, a very immediate device, so it's different from uh, laptops or phones where you know on your phone you may keep a year or so of data. The idea with Glass is you just keep data for um, maybe a week or two at most and then whenever you get onto a Wi-Fi network everything gets sucked up into a cloud and stored for what you want. So it's supposed to be about enhancing the, net, the here and now. So this metaphor works very well with that as well. However, one of the challenges with this is you know this is really about content so how do you get access to your applications? You know, how do you take a picture or um, run a game or something like that. And so what they've, the way that they do that is when you tap on the home screen, it loads up an application menu, which some of you may have discovered, that the, um, the um, menu for Google and um, you know, the game I, I showed you before and, and so forth. So there's still some refinements that might happen in the user interface. Um, the systems you're using now are running the um, what's called XC12, which is the 12th version of the operating system. Um, and um, the hardware is unlikely to change before the devices come into the commercial marketplace, but there may be some more UI refinements. Most recently, um, between XC11 and XC12, they introduced the first lock screen um, mechanism, um, which they didn't have before. So as, as you can um, uh, see, or hopefully tried already, um, Glass is a truly wearable um, computer, so it's, you can really wear this the whole day without um, noticing it. Um, it provides hands-free information access. One of the most interesting parts is this um, Ego Vision camera. So um, here's a picture taken of you know somebody playing with their son, and so now wearing glass on your head, you've got a first-person perspective camera, which you don't not, not often have um, with um, phones or other devices. Uh, you've tried already the interface, so the touch gesture speech. One thing you may not have tried is that when the, the glass goes to sleep, 
Um, you can turn it on by tapping on the, on the frame. If you tilt your head back, it will also turn on as well. So um, there's a user settable um, angle orientation that you can turn it on. And I think right now by default it's about 30 degrees. So if you're biking along and you want to turn on the device, don't, don't want to take your hands off the handlebars, you just tilt your head back, it'll turn the device on, then you can use voice commands to take a picture or record a video or whatever else. And you've got access to all the Google services like maps, locations, um, messaging, and so forth. So um, given that, and given what you've seen so far, um, um, what are some, I'm going to write on the board here a little bit, if I can get a marker. Okay. Oh, that's all very dirty, isn't it? Um, and there's no eraser, of course. So let's just use good old hands. Great. So given what you've seen so far and, um, and what we've talked about so far, what are some applications that you might want to use um, Glass uh, for? And the reason why I'm writing this list up is that uh, sometime today or overnight, um, it would be good, well, you're going to form groups, and it will be good for each group to pick one or more application they're going to try and build this week. So it's just so, so from what you know so far, what are some applications that you might want to put onto um, Glass? Why don't we start with you, David, because I know you want to do an uh, Exa gaming application, right? So some sort of Exa gaming. And I'll show you an example of one of those um, in a minute. Anybody think of anything else? I think it works with Roadworks in Christchurch, and I'd quite like to see if we could do some of these games down the Roadworks and say when you're getting close to it. Right. Okay, so I'll, I'll say there's road conditions. Well, if you're an emergency worker and you have to get to the hospital in two minutes, maybe that's going to be quite useful to know if the road's blocked or, or whatever. Yep. Anything else? I'm wondering about some sort of um, physical performance system. Yeah. Sort of ideas, but I think you can probably have um, some metronomes and speed up slowly. Um. Definitely, yeah. Um, you could have a metronome playing, and you could also maybe show notes you've got to play as well, potentially. Or if you're a singer, you could see the words. It could be a karaoke system, right? It shows you the words. Um, while you're singing, so it could be lots of musical applications. Thinking on that line, uh, like players, things like that, if you're practicing, you can mm -hmm. have your lines show up as, as the scene comes, mm -hmm. just learn the script that way. Uh -huh. yep. That's really good because I guess in many times when you're in the movies or in a play, you want you know you have to do physical actions as well, so you can't really hold your script and do a sword fight or something like that. Yeah. So you want to be able to do something that involves physical actions but still prompting you is what you've got. Any other ideas? Do you have an idea at the back? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so that's if you're watching foreign films, for example, it does a voice to text translation while you're watching the movie. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay, yep. Um, yep. Yep. Got a navigation system, gets up display top. Yeah, I guess it's a little bit like here, but we can put navigation, yeah. Okay, uh, that's enough for now, but just keep that in the back of your mind as we go forward, because um, sometime in the next half day or so, you have to think about an application you think you can build, and we'll see how it goes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you some examples of um, a number of applications that may seed um, your think thought process. Um, so first of all, as I said before, using a device like Glass is very different from using traditional um, mobile phones or, or other devices. So um, I'm sure many of you have been to um, an event where you've seen a whole bunch of people with their phones um, all looking down at their phones while this event's happening in front of them. Like if you go to the rugby ma match, oftentimes people will be on their phones looking at the match or taking pictures or whatever else. So the thing about Glass is that it really lets you live um, life with your head up rather than um, heads down. And this is the point that Tom Chi was making before with his little videos, that oftentimes now in the modern world, people, I, I was um, uh, driving, no, I was walking back from the store the other um, day on Saturday, and there was a woman walking behind me, and um, she had a, was looking at her text messages the whole time she was walking behind me and sending texts as well she was walking. So you know, she was very really lucky that she didn't get hit by a car when she went across the... The road, but you've all seen this kind of situation here. Where people are just uh, at something and sometimes ignoring what's happening in the world around them because they're focusing on what's on their screen. So what Glass does is it allows you to um, 
interact with the world around you while still seeing that screen content information. And that's potentially very important because um, it turns out we use our cell phones a lot every day. I, I found a um, website where they had this stats. They say that people who have smartphones often um, reach or touch the phone about 150 times a day. Um, and here's a breakdown of different usages from messaging all the way down to gaming and, and um, searching and things like that. So if you add up all the amount of time that you're looking at your phone screen or dealing with your phone screen, you've probably got an hour or more a day at least of um, interacting with your, your, with your phone, which is taking you away from the real world. So what Glass tries to do is bring you back to the real world. Now, th there's no um, uh, current app store for Google Glass, so you can't go and um, go to the Play Store like with Android devices and download a bunch of different applications. But there are applications available. And um, so to find them is this website here where you can go called um, the Glass website. And this has, I'll show you a little live demo in a minute. This has um, a set of um, existing applications that have been approved by Google. And um, if you can turn these on or off onto your device. Um, you can also uh, download um, APK files and manually install them onto your device as well. And, and Gunn will talk about that a little bit um, tomorrow. So let me show you the website. So if I go back to my browser here, let's see. I find it. <laughs> oh, it's not really wanted, but anyway, so um, actually, let me cut and paste from the, um, the file. Okay. Okay, it's taking a while. There we go. So you'll see um, nothing right now. So I push this over here. There we go. So um, uh, so here's a bunch of different. Um, uh, glass, they call them glassware, glass apps. Um, so some of the ones you're familiar with, Facebook, Google Now, some ones maybe a little bit more familiar with, Spalista, for example. And so when you've got your Google Glass device, you can enable these apps by clicking on them. See the, the blue check marks? These ones have been installed by default on all the four devices that we have um, right now. But say if we want this one, so a Jewish guide for glass, maybe I'm Jewish and I want to have a a, um, a companion that reminds me of when to pray or what to eat and things like that. Then I check on this here, and then it will ask me if I want to um, enable it. And if I turn it on, then I won't do it now, but if I turn it on, then it um, registers that my device wants to get access to that app, and it will start pushing content from that my app to the, the device. And this is using the Mirror API, which um, Gunn will talk about a bit more um, uh, tomorrow. Um, so this is one way you, you distribute applications for Glass right now. And you can see a wide variety of applications um, from um, news applications like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, sports applications, social applications like Path, um, cooking applications, um, and so forth. A few games, things like that. Um, not that one. So let me give you um, uh, a few examples of some applications. First of all, though, I should um, distinguish between two different types of applications. So um, there is uh, one application that is built um, with the Google Mirror API, and this is what you'll learn about tomorrow. Um, this is basically a server-based application. So for example, uh, the glass displays have all been um, subscribed to um, CNN. So periodically through the day, CNN will push out news reports onto your device. Um, and in this case, um, all that's running on, on glass is a, a small, um, HTML um, or web viewer that's viewing the contents being pushed out to you. And as a developer, you have to develop um, the back-end server code that says what information might be pushed onto the device. So that's the um, Google, Google Mirror API. These applications um, don't uh, tend not to use the sensors on the device itself. And they, um, so then you've got a second class of application, for example, this driving application that um, is a native application that runs on the device. And this is using, in this case, the Glass uh, development kit. So in this course, you'll learn how to build both of them. Um, if you're doing gaming and um, maybe the application that you talked about before, well, actually, the navigation application, oh, yes, you probably need to use it as well because you need to use your, your position data. Um, so let me show you a couple of examples of a few devices. I'll show you some videos and a couple of live demos, and then we'll break up um, for lunch. 
And then after lunch, um, uh, I'll start talking about how you can prototype some ideas for yourself. Um, so first of all, um, one of the examples is this one called um, Strava. So Strava is a, um, a sport application. Um, it's actually installed on, on all the devices you've got right now. And this allows you to um, keep track of your bike um, rides and um, the elapsed time and also the position you've taken and also um, uh, send information to your friends and show you which rides you've made as well. So because um, Glass can, of course, record your position um, and um, your time and has map information, it's really easy to do this. And like you see in the picture there, you can um, um, uh, use uh, Glass uh, while you're riding your bike. So let me show you a little video of, of what that might um, look like. Um, I'll go down here. Yeah. Yeah. Like with um, music's kind of annoying, but um, so you can see he's riding here. Um, it's got a speed up at the top there. Um, the the course that he's or how far he's ridden so far, his time, and also some heart rate information, um, as well. So if you're a cyclist, um, and this could be a very um, useful um, tool to have. I'm not sure. I think that's a mock-up, but I'm <laughs> saying <So>, yeah. <laughs> You would have to have something. We, we do, we, we, maybe, yeah, we're doing some work in the lab here on how, which we'll talk about also um, on uh, Friday, about how you can combine external sensors with glass as well. Because you have a Bluetooth um, um, uh, connectivity on here, then if you have other Bluetooth devices, they could talk to glass and, and as well. So maybe he's got a Bluetooth chest strap or something. Um, so that was the cycling. Um, there's um, cooking. Uh, so I, I don't have a video for this app, but in this case, um, it, it's a social app that um, has um, uh, recipes on it. So you can um, uh, share your recipes or look at recipes from other people, and it will show you um, all the ingredients you need to have and also all the steps you need to go through to, to, to cook the, the meal. And of course, it's really useful because um, cooking is a very hands-busy task. So you can be cooking away while you're in your um, glass display. It's showing you uh, what steps you have to cook with as well. Um, one of you mentioned uh, translation. I think that was back there about using it for um, translation of movies. Well, there's an, actually an app called um, WordLens that allows you to do that. This is a um, uh, some some of uh, because Glass is an Android device. It means that many existing Android applications can be brought across to Glass very easily. And this is a very popular app that runs um, on Android phones. Let me see if I can get it uh, working. If I can find. Hmm. Does any do you have um, with you, Gun, one of the glass displays? The grey one. Oh, that's the white one. The grey one's here. Yeah, okay, great. Let's see if it's... So sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. So we'll see what happens in this case. So the idea with word lens is that you can look at um, text that you um, don't know if, you know, if it's... Um, and then translate it in, in real time. So let's see if it's still... Okay, it looks like we're connected. So um, let me just push this across over here. Now, um, and you can try this for yourself over lunch if you like. You just tap this, and it will go to the menu. And if you go along to the um, horizontally to the end here, so this was the the recipe um, uh, application I was telling you about before, and somewhere, right, translate. Okay, so when I tap this, it's going to turn on um, a, a live camera view. Um, Running on here, it's about five frames a second. On here, it's real time. And then, um, can you pass me your book, please? If I look at the text in the book, then see it says the glass class, and now it translates it. Oh, that's kind of boring because I guess that's exactly the same in French as it was in English. So let's see if it. Oh, is it? Oh, that's not what I want to do. If I, if I tap this, then I can um, go from English to French, maybe. Oh, Italian. Let's try that one. So I've got English to Italian, and now, oops. Okay, now um, I'm going to hold this up here, and it'll look at that, and then it translates it to Italian. And if I hold it back there, it tries to superimpose the words back, and you see the February has also been translated as well. So it's a bit slow on the screen, but in, in my device here, it's running um, at real time. So that's you know, if you're going um, 
dinner, a Chinese restaurant maybe, actually there's no Chinese right now, but an Italian restaurant, and all the menus in Italian, you can now hold up your uh, menu to your glass display and it'll do the translation um, uh, for you. It does, yeah. So it, it's, um, the translation is not very good, so it's designed for um, small phrases. So what they do is they do some computer vision recognition, they recognize the OCR from the words, then they send that phrase um, uh, through the web to a translation service, it translates, it sends it back. Um, and then they take the colors around the text and use that to replace the background. So in the, um, in the picture itself, you'll see, um, oops, if I go back here, you'll see uh, the, the um, clothes for avalanche danger, and then when they show it in the um, WordLens version, it's um, Fermo uh, risk of the avalanche. So um, it'll use it, so it looks quite compelling. One of the other applications is um, for exercising, and this is what Dave is particularly interested in. So there's a company called GlassFit Games that uh, recently got £100,000 in venture capital money to build this uh, app. And actually, the app's been delivered now, but you have to pay $10 to get it, so I haven't downloaded it um, yet. But the idea is that when you go running, um, it can be quite boring because you're running by yourself oftentimes. Um, so what, if, what they're trying to do is allow you to have a virtual running companion. So you go out running and um, you can uh, see uh, this virtual person that's running in front of you and the idea is to try and catch up to the person. Um, when you go running, they record uh, your path and your distance and, and position and then uh, next time when you run the same path, you can run against yourself. So you run around Hagley Park, you run around yourself, or you can also run against um, a world-class um, athlete, so somebody else who's a very good marathon runner. You load up their details and start running with them and see if you can keep up with them as well. So let me show you the video of this um, working. So just like I said before, how exercise can be boring. And not much motivation. So this is the view through the display here. So you go running and the virtual person is running in front of you. There's distance and time, map information. You can use the same thing for mountain biking. So here's your mountain bike. Uh, snowboarding, so anything basically where you can capture a position of some other competitor and then riding through the streets of New York is probably a bit dangerous, but anyway. So um, this is the type of thing that David's interested in doing. Um, and one of the other cases um, that is pretty interesting is, is medical medicine. Um, and in medicine there's many possible um, use cases, so uh, for example, a remote um, educational remote surgery assistance or hands free information. This is a doctor, I can't remember his name, but he was the first person to um, use um, glass in an operating theatre. So, when you, so wearing glass, he would then um, use Google Hangout. That would take a live camera feed from his uh, camera here, it would share it then back to a remote um, person. In this case, he was using it for education, so he was sharing it back with his class, and his class members were all sitting in another location, all seeing the live feed. And because it's a hangout, um, they could also um, give feedback to him um, as, as well, so they have a two-way conversation. Um, so here's some examples of that being used in a, um, a medical um, situation, or a variety of medical situations. Um, so let me show you, I've got a video of that as well. Uh, let me see. Yes, so this is... Um, in this case, um, oh hi Andy, what's going on? I was hoping that you could uh, help me out. Um, we're about to get started with the central line. Pause. So this is um, uh, what he's sending um, through um, glass, and this one Heather is going to help him um, in a training task to put a central line into this. Um, it's a mannequin right now. So um, the remote person is able to see what they're seeing and then and talk them through it. Um, so let me just... Um, uh, I know you know that I've done a number of things before, but I could use some help with the ultrasound. Oh, sure. I'd be happy to watch you do this. So we have our patients all uh, prepped and draped, um, and 
I've identified my anatomic landmarks. Here are the two heads of the SCM. And then why don't I show you the ultrasound images? Okay, that'd be great. Okay, so this is what I see on the ultrasound. So you can see the ultrasound up here. And why don't you talk me through this? Okay, well, um, just want to make sure you have your probe oriented correctly, but from what I see here, it looks like... But, um, so that's one example of uh, remote collaboration with medicine. Another example that's a bit more interesting is what's been done by a company called Vipara, or Vipara, I should say. And what, Vipara are a, a, a medical telepresent or telemedicine company. And previously they built a system like this, which is a little hard to see, but there's a camera um, above the table facing down. And then this on the screen there is the view from an endoscopic um, camera inside the body. And then the doctor here, um, or the, he's the remote expert, he puts his hand on the desk underneath this camera. They, the camera takes a picture of his hand, superimposes it back onto the endoscopic video coming from the remote location, and sends it all back to the remote surgeon. So the effect is, when you're doing the surgery, is that you can see these kind of ghost hands coming out into your uh, field of view, and they will point at different locations um, on the video. And, tell you, and he can tell you different things. So this is a commercial system that already existed, and then most recently they've taken it, and they've um, previously what the disadvantage was was that the surgeon had, was using the endoscopic camera and had to look away somewhere else to see the monitor view from the camera, and and while they perform the surgery. But now what they can do is they can feed the camera feed back into um, glass, and the surgeon can keep on f looking at the patient while they're um, looking at um, glass. So let me show you um, a video of that uh, working. Um, yeah. Very nice. UAB orthopedic surgeon Brent Ponce is on the phone with a colleague in Atlanta. They are looking over some images prior to Ponce performing a shoulder surgery in Birmingham. That extra hand belongs to the Atlanta doctor, Connie Dantelluri. It's telemedicine with a twist. It's real time, real life right there, as opposed to a normal Skype or normal video conference call which is just back and forth dialogue, but it's not really interactive. And it's right there in the operating room, using a virtual reality technology developed at UAB called Vipon, along with Google Glass. The camera in the Google Glass sends an image of the surgical field to Dr. Lurie's computer in Atlanta. He sees what Ponce sees, and Vipar allows him to reach into the virtual field in real time. So you can use glass now as a viewing device to view the, um, the telepresence um, cues coming from the remote person. And when I show this to doctors, they get really excited because they love to be able to ha operate in a sterile environment. They love to be able to have remote people kind of seeing what they're seeing and helping them um, as, as well. So that's a, a case, a, a snapshot of a few examples. Um, let me talk a little about some design principles, then we'll break um, for lunch. So as I said before, um, uh, with glass, it's really about kind of um, being in the here and now. So when you're designing application, you've got to think about 
uh, things like location, context, time information, and, and communication and collaboration. So um, it's a, there's a few uh, important guidelines. One of them is to actually design uh, for glass. So here's, for example, um, on the right-hand side, this is the Google Plus view um, on your phone or your tablet. And you can see there are a number of different streams uh, coming through um, different windows um, showing different Google Plus um, messages being posted up here. Here's the glass version where it's just a single uh, feed um, taking up the whole um, screen. So it's very simple, relevant information. Um, you also want to make sure you don't um, get um, in the way. So the idea is to try and enhance, not replace the real-world interaction. So for example, here's somebody who's at the, um, the aquarium looking at real jellyfish. And it would be great if while looking at the real jellyfish, they could use Wikipedia to search and find more information about jellyfish. Also keeping it relevant. So uh, when you're at the grocery store, that's when you want to show them the um, menu of, or, of um, items from the cooking application. Um, so you want to show information at the right time and place. Um, conversely, um, that is to avoid the unexpected. So you know, here it is at 3.30 in the morning. You don't want your glass display to suddenly send you a message about special cabbage on sale somewhere else. So you don't want to send unexpected content at the wrong time. And you also want to make it very clear to users what your glassware does. You don't want people to sign up for your app and then little do they know they're going to start getting cabbage um, advertisements in the middle of the night. And then uh, building uh, for people. So this is um, using imagery, voice interaction, natural gestures, just the way people do interact with each other in the real world. And focus on a fire and forget interaction model. So you know, with um, Glass, once I've subscribed to CNN, then it's going to push me messages. And I don't have to do anything else except um, uh, click on the message to, to view it or to swipe down to delete it. It's not like I'm going to continually getting, um, needing to interact with the content. And the overarching design um, method is um, focusing on micro interactions. Uh, and this is a, a way of designing computer interfaces that involve um, very small interactions with the technology. So it shouldn't take any longer to interact with the Glass app than it does when taking out your phone, for example. Uh, Thad Stana, who's you know, still involved in the project, he has two positions. He is uh, part-time working for Google on the Glass project, and then part-time he's a professor at uh, Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And in his role as a professor, he's done lots of stu user studies on um, micro interactions, and he's shown that basically, if it takes more than three seconds to get at information on a, a handheld or mobile device, then there's a significant drop off of usage. So, for example, if I asked you to take my photograph, you know, you probably pull your phone out of your pocket. It might take you 30, 40 seconds to take that uh, picture. Whereas with glass, you can, um, you want to take a picture, just push the button, and it's one second that's done. So, by having that immediate um, access to um, the interface and interaction, you can significantly improve the usability of the system. So the last thing I want to show is um, just um, one of my favorite um, videos um, that um, was released um, as one of the promo videos of, of Glass, which is um, about this uh, guy called um, Andrew uh, van der Heuvel. And um, he is a uh, physics teacher. But he's kind of a different physics teacher. He teaches physics for um, distance education. So he teaches for small schools in the US that don't have a, a teacher present. So he does a lot of remote teaching. And so he uh, became one of the glass explorers. And he was able to use uh, glass to go to um, CERN. So there it is. Would have been cool to be an astronaut. My name is Andrew Van Heuvel. I'm a physics teacher from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Through college, I was embarrassed to tell people that I wanted to be an astronaut. It's like I want to be a princess who rides horses while being police officers. It's just it's ridiculous. That's not my passion in teaching. Can you say conservation of angular momentum? I want you to call a non-traditional teacher. I teach primarily online for students whose schools can't offer advanced physics courses. To be a glass explorer means I get to tie together all the things that are most engaging about learning. You know, making every moment teachable moment. The first thing I plan to do in class is take students with me on a virtual field trip as I go to CERN in Switzerland.
Awesome. So that's um gives you an idea of how you can use um, glass to en enhance connection between people. In this case, he was able to go to CERN, which you know is very um, few of us have been there, and at the same time bring a virtual class with them as well. So the people that were in Michigan or wherever they were were able to um, connect back in with them into the into the collider tunnel um, as well. So that's what I wanted to um, share um, this morning. Um, just a little bit more about some of the design principles. Does anybody have any questions about that I've shown so far? So this has all been pretty non-technical, it's just laying the foundation. And what we're going to do this afternoon is I'll start showing you some tools you can use to rapidly prototype some ideas. Um, and the idea is that um, this afternoon to um, be able to break up and work in um, some groups, and start brainstorming about um, application that you might want to build, and then start um, laying out the components of the application. And then tomorrow, um, Gunn will start showing you um, a bit more on the coding side and how you say, actually start building the um, application. But some of the tools I'll show you will enable you to, with, without even writing any lines of code, to see uh, some content and some user interface elements on Glass right away. So even before you start programming tomorrow, you'll be able to see whether or not you can read the text on Glass, whether or not you can interact with it as well. So are there any questions at all? Oh, it's all stunned into silence. So um, we'll take a break. Um, what I'd like to do, though, is um, over lunch, um, now there are some University of Canterbury people here, there are some people not from University of Canterbury, so it'll be great if the um, University of Canterbury people can explain to the uh, visitors where they can get food if they need it. Um, it would be great if you guys can also uh, find some friends and um, figure out a group of people you want to work with on your um, project. Um, you were away just before when I was talking because you came a bit late, but I was suggesting that all the Koreans should probably stick together yeah. because then you can. Um, so um, there's Jane behind you and Hyung Gong and uh, there as well, so you can um, you can work um, together. Um, so we'll meet back at uh, one o'clock. Um, you're more than welcome to take the devices with you and walk around campus and see what it's like, see what people re how re people react to you. <laughs> And um, it'll be good over lunch if you can start thinking about the type of applications that you want to um, build. Because we'll have a, a lecture from 1 to 2 showing you some tools. And then at 2 o'clock, um, you'll break up into um, groups and start brainstorming more about applications. And um, hopefully um, by uh, 5 or so, you'll have a rough prototype done. And if not, you can work over the night as well. Great. So I'll see you all back here at 1 o'clock.